All right. Well, thank you so much um, from SPS uh, for the great presentation, the video, and some questions. We're going to move on to our next panel, the Low Frequency Cosmology Group, um, who are doing work with um, radio waves and also CubeSats. So um, off to the local lab. You guys are up. I'll just quickly share my screen. Can you all see my screen okay? Looks good. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Nivedita Mahesh, and I'll be uh, talking on behalf of our local lab. I'm a PhD student with the lab, uh, and joining along with me are I, uh, Hi, is... I'm Bharat, and I'm also a uh, postdoc at the local lab. Uh, hi, my name is Rue. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student and I work with the lab too. Thank you. Uh, so just before we go ahead into the presentation we prepared for all of you, uh, I want to uh, make a note that this presentation is going to be very interactive. So at the top of the slide, uh, you can see a link that says www.menti.com. I would suggest whatever device you have closest to you, uh, log into it and use this code to have a very interactive session. And this link and the code will be on each of the slide. So hopefully you'll join us along the way. Uh, to start off, uh, this is uh, a group photo of our lab. Uh, so we, we collaborate on all the projects we do. We get together for our meetings. Agreed, the meetings now look very different given the situation, uh, we, but we keep our collaboration going. Um, the group consists of two professors five postdocs, three grad students, and three researchers. Um, so what is LOCO? Uh, LO, L-O stands for low frequency, and CO, cosmology. Basically, we use low frequency technology. What do I mean by that? Technology that your phone, your TV, your radio, satellite communication uses. So we use the same uh, technology as those, uh, which is basically using the radio waves of the electromagnetic spectrum to study some big questions in cosmology, like how did the different structures in the universe, how did the very first stars form? That is the main question we are going for. How did the very first stars of the universe form? When did they form? So basically, we use low frequency technology to study the first stars, hence local. Um, now, I have a question for you all. I don't want to keep talking. So how did, uh, can I ask a question to all of you saying, how did the universe form? So use the interactive medium and just go ahead and type, how do you think the universe form? Or if you know, how did the universe form? Yes, okay. Big bang, yep. <laughs> yeah, I guess we have a concept. Oh, nice, wonderful. So we all know how the universe started. Yes, it started with the big bang and big bang into everything else. So let's go into that if everything else. So let me give you a quick summary of the universe timeline. So yes, it started with the Big Bang, and the Big Bang produced the elementary particles. What do I mean by that? Pa elementary particles of matter and light. When matter, I'm talking about proton and electron, and in terms of light, I'm talking about photons. Now the Big Bang released a lot of energy. So the proton, electrons, and photons are in this hot soup all together. Slowly, as the universe expanded, this hot soup cooled, and the photons are now free to escape. And this is what we are showing in this timeline as we call as the afterglow pattern. So the photons are finally escaping. This is the first time the light escapes and reaches us. And meanwhile, what happens to the protons and electrons? So now they are free. The photons are not there in between. So they are free to combine and form the very first atom of the universe, hydrogen. So for a very long time, it was just hydrogen in the universe. It was nothing exciting. It was, called, it was very boring in the universe. Just hydrogen just existed. And that's the period we're indicating here as the dark ages. Eventually, there were some perturbations, like there were some density fluctuations and the hydrogen came together to form the very first stars. This happened about 400 million years after the Big Bang. This is the period, this is the time that we are interested in what we are going for that time when the hydrogen, the first hydrogens of the universe came together and formed the first stars. This is what LOCO goes for. Um, so how do we study the first stars? We first basically use radio antennas. Radio antennas like dishes, um, 
like the TV used to use. Uh, another important thing is the signal is old, right? We are looking for the very signal from the very first stars. The signal is really weak because it's old. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So a few things that we need to remember because it's such a weak signal is we need to avoid the man-made signals. I told you we're using the same technology as TV phone, right? So it's the same frequency. So all your signals from your TV and phone is noise to us. So we need to go to remote locations, place our instruments in remote locations, and we, that's where we look for the first star signals. Next, since the signal is so weak, it's actually that weak that our instrument noise can also be a problem. So our group spends a lot of time studying and characterizing the instrument noise. Next, the Milky Way, our own galaxy, also emits signals in the same frequency as a phone, TV, the radio waves. So we have to study our Milky Way galaxy well enough so that we can separate it and look for the signal we want. So our group spends good time in studying the Milky Way foreground. Okay, the first experiment. There are a few experiments we focus on. The first experiment is called EDGES. Uh, this is a uh, photo of edges that I'm showing you here. It is located in Western Australia, again, a very remote location. Um, it is the size of your tabletop to give you some scale. It's just like a size, it's a single antenna size of your tabletop and it's actually looking for the very first stars. It's looking, to give you more details, it's looking for the effect the first stars had in its environment. The second instrument that we, uh, we use and uh, we perform science with in our lab is called HERA. Now, HERA is a collection of radio dishes, like I've shown you here. And a collection of radio dishes is called an array. Each dish is about 14 meters wide. And it is located in South Africa, again, a remote location. Um, and currently, to give you a current status, there are about 100 antennas built, but we are looking at a future of where we'll have about 330 antennas. The third instrument that our group focuses on is called the MWA. This is also an array of bow tie antennas. Now, if you look at the picture here, each of these individual white structure, it looks like a bow tie, little bow tie. Um, and it's in Western Australia, like edges. Uh, it has about 60, each of this structure mm -hmm. I'm calling a dipole, and it has about 16 of these, and they form a patch, what we call a patch. And then there are about 128 such patches. So it's quite a huge array. Um, final experiment that Mridula here works on uh, is um, called ECHO. ECHO helps us to calibrate big antennas, like that 14 meter dish in HERA, because I, like I told you, the signal we are looking for is very weak and our understanding our instrument is so important. So to study big dishes like HERA, we use ECHO. It uses this drone. Basically, it's a drone experiment. It's damn cool. It uh, has a drone and it has a standard source, what we call a standard source, like the blue, slight conical blue antenna below the drone. And it flies over big arrays and it tells us what the array looks like, what signal the array receives. So these are the main focus areas uh, of the four instruments or the four experiments that LOCO studies. And I also told you the science we are going for. Um, this is basically loco. This is what we do. Uh, so this was an overview of what I wanted to give you about what we do, what we study, what we focus on. At this time, let's switch into like a little quiz time to just see like if you followed along some fun questions along the way. So the first question, what is the main question loco is trying to answer? Ooh, that was fast. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That was close. Yeah. Okay. So yes, the main, we are interested in a big question in the universe, but the specific question we are interested in is when and how did the very first stars form? Right. Most of you got it right. I'm going to wait for a couple of more seconds, maybe. Or, yeah. But most of you got it right. Yeah. We are trying to study how did the first stars form. There we go. Okay, which part of the electromagnetic spectrum do we use to study the first stars? Yeah. Wow, <laughs> great. I guess we did a good job, guys. Yeah, 
all of y'all are ready to join loco if you're interested right to us yeah we definitely use the radio waves it's what your tv your telephone your satellites your basic radios use yes why are all the loco experiments located in remote locations like in western australia a desert in south africa to avoid rfi yep <laughs> radio silence <laughs> Yep. Minimize noise, less noise. Yep. It's much more quiet. Yeah. We are definitely want to get get away from all the man-made signals. Yes. Got that right. Which experiment uses a drone? Is it Edges, Echo, Era, or MWA? Yeah. Yeah. Echo is Yeah, Echo is the one. Echo is the experiment that uses the drone with a standard source that flies over the big dishes to characterize them. And that's the experiment Brudula here works on. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I was just about to say that we are hoping to use it over MWA someday. So you guys got that right too. Yes. Okay. Correct. Oh, we already have an answer before I ask the question. Wonderful. <laughs> Which experiment uses dishes? I mean, right after Mridula now said at some point Echo Echo flies over the dish, but the experiment uses the drone. Hera is actually the collection of the radio dishes that that the fourteen meter dishes are, and this is in South Africa. Finally, what does Loco stand for? low frequency cosmology lab yep <laughs> yeah so um as the answers come in because most of you have got that right um so this is what we do where um the main science question that we go for is um how do these first stars form and uh, we use the low frequency technology which is basically radio waves and we spend a lot of time characterizing the instrument finding appropriate locations for the instrument and also um separating a foreground milky way from our science and actually looking for the signal and answering the big question this is loco uh the we would be happy to take any questions you'll have at this point thank you Oh, I guess. I think we had one question that said, "Why are dishes shaped as bow ties or parabolas?" So dishes are shaped as parabolas to increase the collecting area, and uh, when we are trying to, uh, so we are trying to build, um, like, trying to have a very big collecting area and to, uh, and to reduce the cost of like each antenna, it's carefully designed to look like these bow ties. So. Uh, the cost is reduced and also uh, you know when you have a lot of them uh, set up in an array you increase the collecting area as well but mostly it's um, collecting area all right um so i think we're going to go ahead to the next presenters but amazing presentation and uh, especially the interactive feature it was amazing so next we are going to be joined by the center for education through exploration and let's dive right in Okay, uh, good morning. My name is Sina from the Center for Education Through Exploration. And I do have a pre-recorded presentation for you today, but I'm also here live. So I'll be monitoring the chat. If you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to pop them in there and I'll respond. I'll also be including the links to the websites that I'm talking about. So you'll have them for easy access. Go ahead and share my screen here.
Hello, I'm Sina from the ETX Center. That's the Center for Education Through Exploration. And I'm here to show you some adventures that are waiting at your fingertips. Lately, you may feel like you're trapped at home, but with our virtual field trips, you can explore the world. Here's a preview of some of the exciting places you can go. Welcome back. Those were some pretty cool adventures, but we're not done exploring yet. What do you want to do next? We could find some small worlds or maybe save a kingdom from peril. You can do all that and more at infiniscope.org. Our NASA funded Infiniscope project allows you to explore the wonders of Earth and space. And our digital learning experiences are aligned to the standards, so you're guaranteed to learn something. The Infiniscope crew is passionate about science education, and they've come up with some amazing experiences for you. Let's hear what they have to say about them. Hi, my name is Melanie Nerish, and I'm a learning designer at the Center for Education Through Exploration. My favorite Infiniscope experience is Kingdom in Peril. In this experience, set in the Middle Ages and Renaissance era, you are a leader. I chose to be an empress, uh, trying to determine what is happening when eclipses occur. Is the sun being eaten by some terrifying monster, as some advisors say, or does it have to do with celestial bodies? You listen to different advisors and use a model to arrange the sun, earth, and moon system to generate solar and lunar eclipses. Let's take a look. And let's see what happens as time passes. So we start moving time forward. And let's slow down and we could zoom in. You can see that shadow is getting closer. And now you could switch from the system view to the Earth view and click at different spots. So if I was in South America, this is what I would see when I was looking out. And then if I was in North America, I would see this. So the sun is now blocked by the moon. And you can Take a look and see how the moon and the sun are all in alignment there. 
So what I love about that experience is I love the historical details woven throughout. It reminds me that science is rich with history and that listening and observing are skills that every leader should have. So become a royal leader yourself and explore the relationships among the earth, moon, and sun at infiniscope.org. Hi, my name is Siobhan. I'm a learning designer at the ETX Center. My favorite Infiniscope experience is Dino Doom. Many people know that an asteroid impact led to the extinction of the dinosaurs, but how do scientists know that? In Dino Doom, you get to explore several locations around the world to discover the evidence that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs and roughly 75% of all animal and plant species 66 million years ago. You start in Italy analyzing microscopic fossils and the chemical composition of rocks. You travel to Spain, Denmark, and Montana to look for global patterns in rock composition. Using your results, you're able to figure out the size of the asteroid that impacted Earth and how big of a crater it left behind. Now you're ready to set on a worldwide hunt for the location of the crater. Finding the crater isn't the end of the story, though. The impact was just the beginning of a devastating chain of events. What other evidence was left behind? Which plants and animals went extinct, and why them? I love that Dino Doom puts so many different locations right at your fingertips in a beautiful, rich, and interactive environment. It allows you to play detective and put together all the pieces to this extinction puzzle. Check out Dino Doom for yourself. Hi, my name is Leon. I'm a learning designer for the ETX Center. That means I get to help make these fun activities on the Infiniscope website. My favorite Infiniscope experience is Where Are the Small Worlds? In this experience, you get to explore our solar system and figure out where some of the small worlds orbit. Small worlds are things such as moons, dwarf planets, asteroids, and comets. Things smaller than what we call regular planets. This experience focuses on asteroids, especially the ones we have explored. Using an interactive map of the solar system, you'll determine the orbit of the asteroid, and then you will get to explore the asteroid up close and in 3D. On top of that, you'll be searching, searching for a hidden prize on each asteroid. I love how after you visit each small world, they become more than dots in the sky. These are actual worlds that humans may one day see up close or even touch. You can check out Where Are the Small Worlds at Infiniscope.org. My name is Maya, and I'm a learning designer with the ETX Center. My favorite Infiniscope In this experience, you work with Lucia and artificial intelligence and the Orbitron 9000 to determine the correct sequence of the phases of the moon in order to reprogram Lucia. The Orbitron 9000 is an awesome tool that simulates the Earth-Moon-Sun system and allows you to observe the orbit of the moon around Earth in three different views. Throughout the experience, you'll perform several tests on Lucia's coding by helping her sort the phases of the moon in the correct order. I like this experience because of the cool retro 80s theme and the fact that it feels like you're playing a game. Check it out for yourself at infiniscope.org. Are you an educator? Infiniscope has lesson plans, student guides, alignment documents, and a host of other resources to help in implementing these lessons with your learners. Join the network for access to additional features and content, and to be notified of upcoming events and new releases. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to check us out online at etx.asu.edu, vft.asu.edu, and infiniscope.org. Okay, thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much, Sina, for being here on behalf of the education or the Center of Education uh, through Exploration. We were so happy to have you and it was a wonderful presentation. If you guys have any more questions or need those resources, you can leave your questions in the Q&A or check the chat um, because we have those links there. 
Um, next up, we have Dr. Williams here to talk about the Ronald Greeley Center for Planetary Studies. Um, and so without any further ado, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Williams join us. All righty. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is David Williams. I'm an associate research professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and I'm the director of the Ronald Greeley Center for Planetary Studies. It is a NASA regional planetary image facility. We have an archive of all of the images returned by NASA's planetary missions, going back to the photographic prints and film negatives from the 1960s through the 90s, and a computer works, set of computer workstations that access all of the digital images from all of the image, uh, missions from the 2000s onward. So um, ASU has been one of the top five schools in the world for doing research in planetary geology and has been for the last 30 years. Uh, our faculty have participated in many NASA robotic planetary missions uh, going back to the uh, 1970s at least. And then several of our faculty have helped train the Apollo astronauts uh, back prior to that in the late 60s. So you see here, this is a poster I made and this highlights a lot of the planets uh, and moons of the solar system that were visited by NASA spacecraft that we have explored. And I'll go through what we're doing right now. Um, at the end of the presentation, uh, there'll be a link that uh, Kim will uh, put out there where you can download an electronic version of this poster for your uh, use at home. So this graphic you're looking at, this is the graphic that NASA's Planetary Science Division is showing of all of the active and upcoming NASA robotic planetary missions that are going to go to various destinations in the solar system or are already at uh, various destinations in the solar system. And I'm gonna modify the graphic to show you all of the missions on which ASU faculty, staff, and students are involved with in our School of Earth and Space Exploration. So there you see the uh, red circles represent missions that are active where ASU faculty, staff, or students have received funding from NASA to be part of the missions as part of the mission science teams. Uh, this one that has a dash line here is the New Horizons spacecraft. That's the one that did the Pluto flyby back in 2015. I'm not an official member of the science team, but I did receive funding from NASA to help the members of the New Horizons mission make the first global geologic map of Pluto. Uh, over here, of course, you see Psyche. This is an ASU-led mission that we've been developing since it was announced back in January of 2017. And you'll have another presentation on Psyche coming up a little bit later in the morning. These other circles are other missions that are in development, such as Lucy. This is a mission that's going to visit the Trojan asteroids, the asteroids that orbit with Jupiter around the sun. And Professor Phil Christensen is designing a thermal emission spectrometer to go on that particular instrument. The JUICE spacecraft, that stands for Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, that is a European Space Agency mission. It is designed to be an orbiter of Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system, the only moon that has its own magnetic field, and it's a moon of Jupiter, and uh, Professor Jim Bell and I are involved with the Italian camera that's going to be on that mission. OSIRIS-REx, of course, has been in the news just this past week after as successfully sampling its, um, its uh, uh, as it orbits asteroid Bennu and is going to return a sample from that asteroid to the Earth. I'll talk a little bit about that more shortly. The Europa Clipper mission right here is the next big flagship mission to the outer solar system. It's designed to be a spacecraft that is going to orbit uh, Jupiter and study the icy moon Europa, which we think has a liquid water ocean underneath its icy crust. Uh, Professor Phil Christensen and others are going to be heavily involved in that mission. He's designing a thermal emission instrument for that to detect heat sources on it. Down at the moon here, you see the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Professor Mark Robinson leads the uh, camera team on that. You heard a presentation about that. The Mars missions, of course, that we've been heavily involved with many of the Mars missions. Uh, the uh, Themis instrument on the, uh, the Mars Odyssey orbiter, Professor Phil Christensen is involved with. I'm a co-I on the German high resolution stereo camera on the European Mars orbiter, Mars Express. And Professor Jim Bell and various other colleagues are involved with the cameras on the rovers, the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover and the upcoming uh, Perseverance rover, the Mars 2020 mission. So we're involved in quite a large variety of NASA robotic planetary missions. And uh, I just wanna show a couple other missions that aren't included in this graphic. 
Uh, Professor Mark Robinson is also involved with what is called Shadow Cam. It's going to be a camera on the South Korean lunar uh, orbiter. It's going to design to image into very, very dark regions of permanently shadowed craters at the lunar poles. So uh, that shows our international involvement. Also, of course, Professor Craig Hargrove has been designing and building LunaMath. It's a CubeSat satellite designed uh, with a neutron spectrometer to measure water ice in these permanently shadowed uh, craters at the moon. And of course, that spacecraft is going to launch on the first test of the space launch system, the SLS rockets, which will hopefully come within the next year or so. And then down over here, uh, you probably heard this summer, there were uh, three spacecraft launched uh, to Mars. One of them was the, the Perseverance rover, Mars 2020. Another was a Chinese mission. And then the third was the first space mission from the United Arab Emirates, the HOPE mission. And Professor Christensen's group developed a thermal instrument for this particular spacecraft. So ASU faculty are not only involved in NASA robotic planetary missions, but also a variety of international missions. So just to take a, a little bit to talk about OSIRIS-REx, this mission uh, uh, led by our colleagues down at the University of Arizona in Tucson, as I said, does have a thermal imaging instrument from Professor Phil Christensen's group. This spacecraft has been orbiting the near-Earth asteroid Bennu here uh, since 2020, uh, since before 2020, actually. And uh, just this past week, they've done the highlight of the mission after orbital mapping, they've actually docked with the asteroid and they use their sample return device to suck up a bunch of small fragments of the asteroid. They're going to put it into a sample return container that's gonna be returned to earth in 2023. So very exciting just seeing that that has actually been successfully accomplished just this past week. So uh, that's a quick overview of our involvement here in CC and ASU in NASA planetary missions. And so we have a couple of minutes left, so I'll be happy to elaborate and uh, answer some more questions. So I'm gonna stop my sharing and uh, we can open up the Q&A and see if there are any questions. And it looks like, uh, let's see here. Uh, can students get involved with these missions? Yes, the answer is yes. If you approach the professor who is involved with one of these missions, uh, you can ask and if they have the resources, uh, students can get involved in the missions in various ways. It's entirely up to the professor and what resources that they have to do that. Next question, are there any plans, where to go? Let's see, are there any plans to, um, are there any plans to do one, uh, to, to one day do missions on planets other than Mars? Well, absolutely. We have missions, you know, as I said, uh, JUICE and the Europa Clipper are going to the planet Jupiter to study out there. Uh, you know, we have uh, 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 considering designs for missions to go to Venus. Uh, you know, the Bepi Colombo mission is a European mission on its way to Mercury. And of course, we have a lot of missions going to the small bodies of the solar system. Psyche, our mission is going to visit asteroid 16 Psyche, which you'll hear about. Lucy is going to visit the Trojan asteroids that orbit with Jupiter. Um, so, and I was involved in NASA's Dawn mission, uh, which just ended about a year ago. And that mission orbited the two most massive objects in the main asteroid belt, the asteroid number four, Vesta, and dwarf planet Ceres. Uh, that was a successful mission that I was involved with. So yes, there is uh, plenty of, 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 of different objects in the solar system that we're visiting. Is ASU one of the major NASA research facilities? Well, we're not a, officially a part of NASA in terms of we're a NASA facility like, like uh, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center or the Marshall Space Flight Center. It's just a lot of our faculty are involved with NASA funded projects and missions. So NASA will send money to ASU and that money goes and uh, is going to, uh, you know, it funds faculty, it funds students, uh, undergrad students and graduate students there. So uh, lots of, of, of NASA involvement here. And I just talked about the Planetary Science Division. The cosmologists have talked about whether they're funded from the Astrophysics Division to do uh, more research you know, on the other parts of the great universe there. So very heavily involved here at ASU. Are there any other questions? Uh, we're actually going to move on to the next panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. All um, right. Thank you very much. Grant. 
Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to a video presentation sent to us by the uh, Center for Meteorite Studies at ASU. It's one of the largest collection of meteorites in the world, and they gave us a video. So let me pull that up real quick. Okay. Welcome to the Center for Meteorite Studies at Arizona State University. My name is Dr. Devin Schrader. I'm the interim director of the Center for Meteorite Studies. And today I'm going to take you on a tour of the meteorite vault and through four and a half billion years of solar system history. Well, welcome to the meteorite vault of the Center for Meteorite Studies at Arizona State University. We have one of the world's largest meteorite collections that's based at a university in the world. Uh, we have specimens of over 2,000 distinct meteorites, and that's 2,000 distinct objects that were seen to either fall or were later found. And so falls are objects, uh, meteorites that are seen to fall, observed by someone, and then later picked up. Finds are meteorites that could have been on Earth for a day, but was not seen to fall, or meteorites that have been on the Earth for millions of years and were later collected. Um, of those 2,000 distinct meteorites, we have over 40,000 individual pieces. So from some meteorites, we have hundreds of pieces from that fall or find. Uh, other meteorites, we only have one piece. So meteorites can be categorized into three major types. Stony meteorites, stony iron meteorites, and iron meteorites. So probably the most famous stony meteorite is the Allende meteorite, which fell in Mexico in 1969. Over two metric tons of material fell, so that gives scientists a lot of material to work with. This meteorite has been heavily studied and researched uh, at ASU and around the world, and I myself have also studied this meteorite. These are some large specimens that we have not cut and probably never will because uh, they're just beautiful and important historically. Uh, the one at the, on the top shelf uh, that you can see right now is still covered in mud and grass from when it first impacted the ground. So that's a pretty spectacular specimen. Uh, but to learn about the meteorite, we have to cut, polish, and look at the inside and analyze the individual components of the end of the meteorite. So now, I'll take you over to a slice of the end of the meteorite to get to see what's on the inside. So this is what the end of the meteorite looks on the inside. So we cut and polish it uh, with a diamond encrusted saw and then polish it down uh, to a nice mirror polish. And so you can see there's a lot of different objects in this slice. There's these large uh, white inclusions. Some of them look kind of funny like amoeboid. And then there's a lot of uh, kind of bluish gray material. First, I'll talk about the large white inclusions. Those are called calcium aluminum rich inclusions. And those are actually the first material to condense into a solid at the beginning of the solar system. So when the solar system was just hot gas and dust, these were the first solids that condensed out, just kind of like rain droplets condense out of a rain cloud. And so by dating these, we actually know how old the beginning of the solar system was. And work done here at Arizona State University concluded that these objects are 4.567 billion years old. So when you hear about how old the solar system is, studying these objects is how we know that number. The material in between the CAIs is a collection of chondrules. The chondrules are roughly spherical objects, uh, but in a slice, they look like circles. And these are objects that formed from uh, kind of little dust balls that were freely floating in the early solar system that were melted to high temperatures to where they almost completely liquefied. And those formed mostly after calcium aluminum inclusions until about 4.5 million years uh, after CAIs formed. And so we can study them to learn about the time after um, calcium aluminum rich inclusions formed. And then material in between the chondrules and the calcium aluminum rich inclusions, it's a bit hard to see, but everything that isn't a round little circle, uh, we call matrix, and that's fine grain material. And that's really fascinating to study. That was material that did not get up to those high temperatures that formed calcium aluminum rich inclusions or chondrules. And so in the matrix are preserved in some carbonaceous chondrites, which uh, Allende is a carbonaceous chondrite. Sometimes there's uh, organic material preserved, so not life, but organic molecules. And there's also objects called pre-solar grains, which are little uh, dust grains that formed around other stars before our solar system existed. Yep. So next we have stony iron meteorites. And these are meteorites that come from asteroids that uh, got up to high temperature and melted uh, throughout the asteroid. And so heavy elements such as iron sank to the center of the asteroid, whereas lighter uh, things like rocky material uh, float into the surface. And so stony iron meteorites, particularly this one, a palisite, 
we think represents the core mantle boundary in these melted meteors or these melted asteroids. And so here we have a nice mixture of stony and iron material. So this is the stony material. This is an iron magnesium silicate called olivine. And on Earth, we have olivine, and it's a deep mantle uh, mineral. So by studying meteorites, we can actually help learn about uh, our own planet, about how our own planet may have formed. And then this shiny material is actually iron nickel metal. And so the core of an asteroid, we think, is going to be mostly iron nickel metal. Uh, but these palisites are a mixture of iron nickel metal and this uh, deep mantle mineral olivine. So we think this represents the core mantle boundary of an early formed asteroid. So the last major type of meteorite we have are iron meteorites. And these are meteorites that also came from melted asteroids, asteroids that formed at the very beginning of the solar system with enough heat through radioactive decay to melt. So the heavy elements like iron and nickel sank to the core of the asteroid. And this meteorite we think does represent uh, the remnant of an ancient asteroidal core. So the pattern you're seeing there, the crisscross patterns, is called the Widmanstadt pattern. It's actually the crystal structure of iron nickel metal. By studying it, we can learn about how slow um, this asteroidal core cooled. This one in particular, we think cooled between um, around 10 degrees Celsius uh, per 1 million years. It took a long time to cool down from high temperature, about 1,000 degrees Celsius or more that it got up to. And so by studying these iron meteorites, studying these ancient asteroidal cores, we can actually learn about early planetary differentiation and what our own planet may have gone through during the first stages of uh, melting. And since we cannot get to our own uh, core on Earth, by studying iron meteorites, we can also learn about the core of our own planet. I'm Dr. Gemma Davidson. I'm a research scientist here in the Center for Meteorite Studies at Arizona State University. And in addition to meteorites from asteroids, we also have a large collection of samples from the moon, such as this uh, lunar meteorite here. This is Northwest Africa 5000. And we also have pieces of Mars. So this is a famous Martian meteorite uh, called Los Angeles. And then here in my hand, I have a Martian meteorite. This is Northwest Africa 7034. This is also known as Black Beauty. You see it's a very, very dark meteorite. It's also quite beautiful. And this is the only meteorite that we know of that is most representative of the Martian crust. So here what I'm holding in my hand is a piece of Mars's crust. And we've been doing a lot of research on this here at ASU in uh, collaboration with Professor Minakshi Wadwa, the director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration. We've been working on this sample to investigate water on Mars. So you may have heard that, you know, these different uh, robotic space missions have found uh, traces of water on Mars. Well, this sample gives us a chance to analyze that water in the lab. So in these different components of this meteorite, there's trapped very, very tiny amounts of water on the parts per million level. So, you know, it's, it's a very dry rock, but there is water trapped in the minerals there. And we've been able to analyze that water to determine what the water composition of Mars's crust is. And that can tell us about where Mars got its water. Thank you for joining us today for the tour of the Meteorite Vault at Arizona State University's Center for Meteorite Studies. We hope you enjoyed it and that you'll come visit us sometime in the future. All right, that was an amazing video. ASU does have an, am an impressive collection of meteorites. And next we explore the questions, is it alive? and can it survive? Our next presenters will shine some light on it. Let's welcome them. Thank you for that welcome. We're just gonna take a moment to pull up our presentation. All right, hello everyone. And welcome to Is It Alive? Can It Survive? I am Brooke Jensen, and here with me today are my colleagues, Zen Holmes and Zoe Swan. And all three of us are second year graduate students here at ASU. And we are also all part of a club called Bagels, which explores the idea of life on life in space, which is exactly what astrobiology means and what we'll be looking at today. And you might recall, Dr. Young talking about astrobiology earlier this morning. With astrobiology, we can look at life in the past or present, as well as the potential for life in the future. And scientists can ask interesting questions through astrobiology, like how and where did life begin? 
and might there be life elsewhere in the universe? But to answer these questions, we first need to answer a bigger question. What is life? How can we determine what is alive and what is not? Today, we will be looking at soil samples from planet Awesome Sauce, planet Bomb Diggity, and planet Coolio. We will discuss the different ways that life is classified and described and apply that to our soil samples to determine if they are alive. So without further ado, let's dig into our soil samples and see what we find. All right, my name is Zoe Swan and today um, I'm going to walk you through these soil samples. Um, so let's get started. So each cup has a soil sample from three planets and no one knows if there is anything living in the samples. So today let's make careful observations to figure out if there is living material in each of these soil samples. We'll use our eyes and our ears and our noses. Now we will pour some water on each of the samples to see what happens. Observe carefully. What do you see happening? All right, let's do a smell test. Let's try and figure out which one smells the most. Looks like cup C smells the most. Okay, let's wait five minutes and see what happens next. In the meantime, I'm gonna hand you over to Zen who will tell us about um, uh, more properties of life in space. Hi everyone, I'm Zen Holmes and I study the chemistry of living things here at ASU. Um, while we wait for our experiment, uh, let's talk a bit about life. Like Brooke said earlier, one of the things that we do as astrobiologists is to search for life, potentially in other places. But to do this, we have to agree whether something's alive or not. And sometimes it's pretty simple. Like my friend Belle here, the dog, she reacts to me and she eats and jumps and plays. And rocks don't do any of those things. So pretty sure Belle's alive and a rock's not. But other times it's harder. Is a computer alive? Well, you're watching this presentation on a computer right now, so you know it changes and takes some energy. But if you leave a computer alone, it's not going to make more computers, and it can't sustain itself, it can't keep itself going. So it's hard to say. And the other thing to think about is small organisms, microorganisms, some things really, really tiny, like bacteria. Well, you can't see them in the same way that you can see Bell, but maybe there are other ways to tell if they're alive or not. So keep this in mind as we go back to our experiment. All right, and now before we move forward, I wanna give you guys a poll and I wanna ask which sample did you think was alive? The first one, the second one, or the third one? Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of cup B's and cup C's. Wait a few more minutes. Look like a lot of you think it was cup C. Okay, so let's, let's try and figure out the answer now that five minutes have passed. All right. So welcome back. Now that five minutes have passed, let's look at each cup to see what's happening. While you were waiting, we stirred each cup. For 
first, let's look at cup A. Does anything seem to be moving? Are there any properties of life that we that Zen just mentioned that would be useful in identifying life here? And then cup B. At first there were bubbles, but it doesn't look like there are anymore. And now cup C is making a mess. What's happening in there? Which one do you think has the living sample in it? Let's do the poll now. Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of cup C. All right, I'm going to end the poll so you can share, um, so I can share with you the results. Yeah, it looks like a lot of you said cup C. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a, a different topic, and then I'm going to um, reveal what was in each of those cups, and we'll talk about it more. All right, so um, one of the things I study is actually how do humans survive in space, specifically what happens to the brain in space. And there are lots of things we need in order to survive. First of all, space is really cold. It's the icy cold of space, so we definitely need some source of heat. Next, space has negative pressure. It's a, it's a total vacuum, so um, we need to compensate for that pressure with spacesuits, with um, uh, habitats, and things like that. Next, of course, there's no air in space, so we need to make sure we have air. Protection from things like radiation, the vacuum of space, the cold of space. And lastly, gravity. Gravity and pressure are, are the, the coolest ones, I think, um, from the human body perspective, because um, uh, having negative pressure in the body can lead to all sorts of changes in your blood and in your brain. and um, we can live without gravity in the short term, but in the long term, we, we begin to have some ill effects. So um, when I was coming up with this slide, it was actually harder to figure out what we don't need in space than what we need. So just um, a little a little thoughtsical there for you. All right, now let's go back and then we'll reveal what was in each of those cups. So as you can see, a lot of you had it right. So. Um, all the, the experiment, all the samples were similar in that they all had warm water and sugar. First, uh, the, in the first sample, the final thing we added was salt, and it didn't do much, not very exciting, so not a lie. Um, in the second sample, we had uh, fizzing alpha salts of tablets, and you saw that reaction, but you also saw that reaction stop after a while. And the third thing was indeed the sample, and it contained a living organism. It contained yeast. Uh, it's a really small living organism, which you couldn't see uh, necessarily, but you could see evidence that it was doing something. And that doing something kept going. It didn't stop after a while. This is something astrobiologists do all the time. It's called looking for biosignatures, evidence of life. And in the same way that we used our eyes and our ears and our noses in this experiment, that's what astrobiologists are doing when they send big telescopes and instruments and um, all kinds of things into space to, to see if we can find life in other worlds. So that about does it for our experiment, and we'll go over to Brooke with some of your questions. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed our experiment. We have links that we will share with you uh, with more astrobiology activities you can try at home. And now, if there is enough time, we will be happy to answer any of your questions. And from seeing the open questions still in the Q&A, I don't think any of them pertain to us. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, is it alive and can it survive? Uh, special thanks to Zoe, Zen, and Brooke for this wonderful presentation that you guys put together for us. And if you guys have any more questions for them, go ahead and leave that in the Q&A as well. And we'll make sure that we're checking that regularly.
Uh, up next, we have a very special uh, group of lecturers. We have Dr. Z as well as Emily Luffy, and they're here to discuss a really neat program at ASU called Sundial. And so I'm going to hand it off to them. Dr. Z, did you want to say anything before I begin, or should I just go? I'll just go ahead and start. Um, my name is Emily Luffy, and I'm a senior in the biophysics program undergraduate at ASU. And I'm also a mentor in the Sundial program. And this is a you know, jargon talk that I developed. Um, And um, I do my research in the single molecule biophysics lab at ASC Biodesign, as well as the Ross lab in the Department of Physics. And I'm also supported by the NASA Space Grant. Um, a couple other things about the Sundial program is it's basically just a really supportive environment for lots of different STEM majors. And um, we develop these no jargon talks um, to help communicate our ideas to everybody, regardless of their background. And the question that I'm really interested in is what causes a cell to change its structure and behavior? And as we'll go through, it's actually a lot more complicated. And hopefully this will help a lot of different aspects of exploration and um, human health. So obviously, why is this important? Why is this an important question to ask? So there's a lot of research that's shown that there's more to diseases such as osteoarthritis, asthma, some types of cancers, inflammation, and malaria um, than just changes to DNA sequence. Um, there's also a lot of research on treatments for these diseases, obviously, but not really a research on what fundamentally causes a normal cell to change its structure and behavior on the level of the cell. Um, the labs that I'm involved in have shown that the texture between normal cells and cancer cells are actually um, quite different and that cancer cells are a lot squishier than normal cells, which allows them to move around. And as you can see in this image on the right, um, this is what the normal nucleus of a cell looks like. And then the cancer cell is quite abnormal. And these studies have shown that um, the more abnormal this nucleus looks, the more aggressive a particular form of cancer is, for example. Um, but the good news is for some types of cancer is that our changes in DNA, um, they, we have new technology that can edit DNA with high precision. And this is really cool because um, it's also the first Nobel Prize awarded to two women, um, which is just a couple weeks ago, October 7th. Um, the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier and Dr. Jennifer Dudna for their work on creating CRISPR technology to change um, mutations or changes in DNA sequences. And they've been successfully treated in patients in clinical trials that should hopefully be used in cancer treatments. But back to our question. So what causes a cell to change its structure and behavior? As I showed, it's not just a change in DNA sequence, so what is it? Um, but I think this analogy is a good way to approach this question, so I'm gonna start with this, and it's weed maintenance. So if you garden, you know that there's various tools and treatments that you can use to keep weeds at bay. But often to completely get rid of them, you have to get to the root of the problem and pull them out by the root. But imagine that you're gardening and you keep pulling all the roots out, but the weeds keep coming back. Studies actually have shown that a lot of invasive plant seeds spread through irrigation water in Arizona. And a lot because a lot of landscape waste is often dumped into the canal instead of where it should be. So this shows that the weeds are invading because of errors in the regulation of the system. In this situation, the system is society, the rules are policies, and the regulation is people, in this case, not following the policies. So back to our question, what causes a cell to change its structure and behavior? Um, in this situation, the system is cells, the rules are DNA, and then the regulation 
is proteins, in this case, not following the DNA. So again, why is this important? So studies suggest that many types of cancer are caused by these errors in how DNA is regulated by proteins. And our chromosomes, our DNA wrapped around proteins, and which the segments are called chromatin. And here's the picture here, what are chromosomes? Um, protein with the DNA wrapped around, and each little segment of the proteins and DNA wrapped around is called chromatin. And a major variable in the overall cell nucleus structure is chromosome structure and behavior. And it's suggested that, you know, these errors in DNA are regulated by the specific proteins and chromosomes. So these proteins regulate whether sections of DNA are on or off. And that's a specific kind of genetics called epigenetics. So these changes to DNA are expressed by proteins and they have, are believed to have both lifestyle and environmental causes that can also be passed on from generation to generation and inherited along with DNA sequences. So then our question comes down to another question, which is how are DNA and proteins organized in chromosomes? And this is a really gray area that's not completely understood. Um, but the challenges of this are that an average human hair is 1,000 times wider than the average cell nucleus and also 30,000 times wider than DNA, which makes it really difficult to get information to help us figure this out. So fitting each cell's DNA in the nucleus is like fitting a string the length of the Empire State Building underneath your fingernail. And once again, the scale of these changes really makes them challenging. So once again, we have the DNA, um, chromatin, which is the DNA and the proteins, and then how these exactly all fit into chromosomes is still not understood. So once again, back to our big question, why, what causes a cell to change its structure and behavior? And why is it important? Humans are made up of over 74 trillion cells and they are not all the same in regards to their structure and behavior. Cells are, are normally subjected to lots of different forces. And for example, I gave um, blood circulating like a raft going through ripper rapids. You have this raft going through some ripper rapids over here. And then also there's clumps of crowded neighbor cells within tissues and organs that are all bending, pushing, compressing, and deforming. Um, for example, I have this image below the river raft of a cell squeezing through a narrow gap. And as the cell squeezes through a narrow gap, there's forces that are put onto the chromatin inside the cell, which cause damage and with, with the proteins to regulate the repair of them. So research has shown that these physical forces can cause these changes to structure and function of the cells and it all comes down to the structure of chromatin. And it's still not understood exactly what the physical signal is or how the cell remembers these physical signals and changes the structure of the cell. So the bigger picture is obviously really important. There's research that has shown that there is more to diseases such as osteoarthritis, asthma, some types of cancer, inflammation, and malaria that changes these DNA expression of these DNA sequences. And these changes are both chemical and physical, but it's not understood how the physical aspects of this, in particular on the level of chromatin, respond, react, and cause changes to cell structure and behavior physically. But we're working on it and researchers in the labs that I mentioned, single bio, bio, molecule biophysics lab and um, the Ross lab at ASU are working on these. So back to our analogy, we're identifying the cause for weeds spreading um, by identifying how, how to both prevent and fix it. Um, and in this situation, we're identifying the causes of, of cells to change their structure and behavior in order to identify how to both prevent and fix these things. Um, this is really important also in relate, um, regards to space and earth exploration by making it safer for humans to go on these missions and also in built environments, new technologies, et cetera. So in particular, the research that I work on is what causes a normal cell to change into a cancer cell. And we do this by extracting 
chromatin from both normal and cancer cells. And we create images of it with a tiny little uh, needle on the edge of a piece of metal. And it bumps up and down to create an image of what the structure looks like. And we are also attaching different things to the ends of these needles to identify the different types of proteins that are also related to these different pieces of chromatin. And our results will hopefully gain an insight into what causes these errors in protein regulation that have been shown to cause many types of cancers and other diseases. And these are a couple examples of some of the images and also a uh, uh, confocal image of both a normal cell and a cancer cell. And just want to say thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I have my email there. All right. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to uh, enter them into the Q&A chat box. And our next presenters are from ASU NASA Space Grant. And let's welcome them. And I hope you guys dive in. Hey everyone, I'm Chris, a fourth year undergraduate in the Department of Physics here at ASU. I'm here representing NASA Space Grant, which is a program at various institutions across the U.S. that provides internship opportunities for undergraduates. Students interested in pursuing STEM-related research that aligns with NASA's mission directorates can work side-by-side -side with faculty members at their respective institutions to get hands-on experience that will prepare them for their careers post-graduation. My lab works on the determination of the structures of various biological molecules called proteins. That's what I want to talk to you about today. So one way we can determine the structure of a protein is by using microgravity to crystallize it. And so I know that's kind of a lot to take in if you haven't really heard that much about this before. So I'm going to start at the beginning and just define, you know, what is a protein and why does it matter? So a protein is a molecule encoded by your DNA that serves a crucial role in the structure or function of our cells or bacterial cells or even viruses. So for instance, a protein might be a gatekeeper on the surface of a cell that determines, you know, what goes in and what goes out. Uh, alternatively, it might just be an antibody that helps fight diseases within our body. Um, or it could kind of be the opposite, where it's a spike on the surface of a virus that helps it get into our cells and cause trouble. So you can kind of see right away, you know, why do we want to know about the structure of proteins? Well, if there's something going wrong with our proteins, they're not acting correctly. Or if there's a protein that's causing trouble, like on the surface of a virus or a bacteria, then if we know about that protein, we can start to develop treatments and maybe try to fix the problem. So then, what is a crystal? Um, a crystal is just a repeating 3D pattern of molecules. So I have a nice 2D slice of a 3D pattern here of what a protein crystal might look like. So you can kind of see in the green boxes is uh, this repeating pattern here, where on the lower left you have a protein, on the upper right you have a protein, but it's actually facing the opposite direction if you look very closely. And so this kind of pattern just repeats and repeats and repeats over and over, uh, up and to the side, and you know, also in 3D uh, towards us, away from us. And so in the end, it ends up forming structures like this. And so the reason we want these types of structures is because, well, we found out uh, that if we shoot X-rays at these crystals, they will scatter. And they'll scatter in certain ways, depending on the shape of the protein that makes up the crystal. And so when you scatter them at various angles, you end up getting an image like this. And so what we can do is run this image through some software and it can make predictions about the structure of the protein. Um, unfortunately though, it's not always that easy. So some proteins like uh, actually the coronavirus, um, it's actually because we've studied uh, various proteins that are in the, the family of the coronavirus uh, for years now, uh, we were actually able to determine the structure of some of the proteins on the coronavirus pretty quickly. And that's why we've been able to start working on vaccines and medicines uh, so fast. On the other hand, there are some proteins that you can spend, you know, months, maybe even longer, just trying to get a good crystal, but all your crystals are too small because they have impurities. Um, it's kind of a big frustration. It leads to a lot of holdups in getting good medicines. Um, 
to treat various illnesses. And so the reason this is a problem is because of what we call low resolution images, which is on the left here of this image I have up versus a high resolution image, which is on the right. So in our low resolution image, you can see around the second ring there, there's kind of a, a little bit of a darker spot, but you can't really tell is the top part darker, is the bottom part darker, you know, you really, it's hard to see. Whereas on the right, you can see, okay, the top is definitely darker there. And so what this means when we run this through our software is um, on the top left, you can kind of see what we have know as a high resolution image. Um, the numbers there on each image, uh, as they get lower, our resolution is higher. So you can see on the top left, you can really make out the predicted structure, which is in blue, versus the actual structure, which is in green. You know, that predicted blue structure is actually pretty close to that green structure. That's kind of what we want to see. We can see, you know, there's that nice donut shape where there's a hole in the center, um, and then a little like jutting out that makes up the ring. And then there's also towards the bottom of our structure, you can see, okay, there's definitely a molecule jutting out there, where if we go all the way to our bottom right image uh, with the big three in the top, you can see the blue structure, it kind of gets the general shape, but it's kind of just like a big blob. You can't exactly tell exactly where everything is in there. Is there really that ring at the top there? Is that molecule at the bottom that's jutting out um, really there? And so uh, it was kind of a problem because we want as accurate an idea of what a protein looks like as possible. And so that's where microgravity comes in. So gravity actually has a big effect on uh, the growth of protein crystals. So what ends up happening is the denser things in solution, uh, because typically to crystallize a protein, we it takes a lot of work. You have to add a bunch of uh, different things in there. Uh, those denser particles, they'll start to move towards the bottom just because of gravity. They're, they're denser um, than the rest. And so what this what happens is this causes some currents in the solution. Those currents tend to disrupt crystal growth. And so you get you know that image on the left there where the the growing crystal is kind of unhappy. It's because all those impurities are going to get incorporated because of those currents. Um, whereas on the other hand, that protein that's chilling out at the top, um, that's not really so worried about gravity. Uh, it's it's going to be able to grow much larger and incorporate fewer impurities. And so what that translates to is here we have on the left crystals grown in space, on the right crystals grown on Earth. Um, you can see that in space, because we have what's called microgravity, where uh, because we're up above the Earth, we still have some gravity acting on us, but it's, it's a much lower effect than if we were on the surface of the Earth. Um, those currents are kind of less, uh, they're, they're not there as prevalently uh, versus on Earth, and so the crystal growth is not disrupted, and we get these much, much nicer crystals. Um, and so that's kind of the basics of growing crystals in microgravity. Uh, if you want to learn more, I have lots of citations. Um, unfortunately, my research group has still yet to publish uh, their work on this. So I had to borrow some pictures and various things from other papers. But uh, those papers are absolutely great. Uh, a lot of them are actually written so that just between uh, some basic knowledge of biology and Google, you can learn a lot about these subjects. So I really recommend you check out some of these places. Um, and of course, I have to thank my lab, which is called the Center for Applied Structural Discovery, which is in biodesign there at ASU, and especially my mentor, Dr. Deborah Hansen. Um, and of course, NASA Space Grant, which helps fund my research there. Uh, and thank you so much for coming to this talk, and I'm now going to be open to questions. Okay, well, thank you very much for the, the ASU NASA Space Grant folks and a, a wonderful presentation by Chris Ramirez. Um, we're going to move into our next panel, the Cosmology Research Group that focuses on the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, they're going to talk a little bit about the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, show a cool simulation, and then also a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope in the future. So I'm going to pass it off to Liam Nolan. Liam? Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Liam Nolan, and uh, I'm with the uh, Cosmology Research Group led by Roger Windhorst. And uh, I will be talking to you guys a little bit about uh, the research that we do, uh, as well as showing off a really cool tool that we've developed uh, for outreach purposes and education purposes of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And you can actually see the Ultra Deep Field on this image here, but we're going to talk about it a bit more in just a second. Uh, I'm also a Space Grant intern, uh, just like some of the previous presentations, and I'm an undergraduate, if I didn't mention that before. I don't remember. That's fine. 
So some of you might be wondering, what is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field? Well, that's not what I meant to say. Some of you might be wondering, what is the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, it's a really big telescope that's up in space. Shocker. Uh, it's been in operation since 1990, and it's essentially just the same sort of telescope that you'd have on Earth, and it uses the same kind of wavelengths that we use for light with our eyes. So we call that the optical. But a big benefit of having a telescope in space is that you can have uh, you can ignore a lot of the big problems that come up from uh, issues with the atmosphere and clouds and things like that and all the things that ruin an astronomer's day. When you have something this far up in space, you can actually take really really powerful images, such as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Uh, you're seeing the same image here, actually in a redder band of light, but it's the same image. Uh, and the really cool thing about this is, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but you can probably see that on this image, there are many objects all over this, uh, the screen, and some of them have these little spikes. What probably won't shock you is those are stars. What might shock you is that everything else in this image is a galaxy. All these little multicolored dots are collections of stars just like our Milky Way. And the even crazier thing is, this is a dark portion of the sky. Hubble looked at a size, an area on the sky, the size of your thumbnail if you held it out at arm's length away from you. And that tiny portion of the sky had thousands and thousands of galaxies in it. And all of these will have stars, planets, all these sorts of things, which is really crazy. Uh, Roger Windhorst likes to make the comparison that the brightness of some of the things that we're talking about are like if you could see a firefly on the moon. It's that dim. And th these galaxies are all over the place in our universe. And these are some of the things that we're really interested in in our research group. And we're going to come back to this in just a minute. Another project that we're doing with Hubble Data is called SkySurf. 95% of the light that is received by the Hubble Space Telescope actually comes from very close by the Earth. And a lot of what most people consider general astronomy throws out that light because we're interested in stars or galaxies or all these very far away things. But we can actually learn a lot about the uh, different uh, types of materials that are very close by, even in our solar system, if we do an analysis of that light. And that's actually the goal of our SkySurf project. And we have lots of undergrads, grad students, and doctors working on these different things, research doctors. Uh, we also have the James Webb Space Telescope, and many of you, I'm sure, have heard of it. A lot of people talk about the JWST as the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, and that's kind of true in that it's a very large space telescope. It's going to be up uh, outside our atmosphere, but it actually uses the infrared, which is a more red kind of light, but that actually allows us to see even further in the cosmological history. And that can be used to study things like the very first light that we can see in the universe, as well as reionization and all these different complex things. Now, I'm actually covering up on my own notes with the Zoom things. Give me just a second. We're also using a lot of analysis of things like the North Ecliptic Time Domain Field, which is a, essentially this little area in the sky very close to the North Pole, where the JWST Space Telescope the JWST can actually look at constantly throughout the year, and that allows us to do a lot of cool research, and that's something that I'm involved in. So then finally, we actually come to our simulation, AHA, Appreciating Hubble at Hyperspeed. This is a educational tool that we've developed in which you can actually generate a 3D simulation of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So you can actually fly through that image we saw earlier and see galaxies whizzing by around you in order to see them up close and personal. So you can actually download this tool yourself at aha.asu.edu, but I'm going to show you a demo in just a second. So if you'll give me just one moment. Do, do, do. All right, you should be able to see the tool right now. Someone stop me if I'm doing it wrong. Uh, currently, you can actually see the same image that we saw before, but you might notice that it's a lot less dense. There's not much as much of the screen taken up by all these bright objects. That's because we've actually created the z-axis where all the really far away galaxies are even further away from us in space so that we... Looks like we might have lost Liam for a second, maybe uh, connectivity issues. Um, hopefully he'll able to get back to us. Um, 
I, I am actually a part of this group as well. Um, so AHA is a great tool. I highly encourage anyone to check it out on the website that was provided before. Uh, so basically you can go through space and view all these distant galaxies. Um, some of them are uh, the similar shapes that we've seen and some of them are really far away in red. Um, I'm, Do we I'm, maybe wanna take some questions from the Q and A if there's a question about Liam or Alex's research? Um, there doesn't seem to be any questions relating to the Hubble Ultra Deep Field group, um, unfortunately. It, but it looks like we have lost Liam. 